Do masks work? Do they help curb the transmission of COVID-19? Are there health risks associated with wearing a mask? I am Vincent Sivanong, and I am not a doctor. Given my staggeringly impressive credentials, I'm going to be taking a look at this subject, investigating the claims made by anti-maskers and the scientific studies that they themselves quote regarding the efficacy of masks. Welcome to episode two of Not A Doctor. You can now find Not A Channel on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and a bunch of podcasting platforms. You can also see a written version of this on Medium. It's a way to go through step by step and be able to slowly see what I'm talking about and fact check my fact checking. Okay, on to the episode. Probably one of the most controversial issues through this pandemic has been about wearing a mask or not. Before starting the research for this video, I was a pro masker. My understanding was that masks work and that they're best used as what we call source control so that somebody who's sick coughs and it gets blocked and you don't transmit it to other people. But I went into this asking the question, is my gut feeling, is my instinct, is my personal understanding, my personal opinion, is it actually backed by any scientific data? I wanted to approach this in the most unbiased way possible. So what I did was I asked around on social media, I joined some anti-mask groups, I contacted some of my friends who are anti-maskers and I asked them to send me their links. Any links that point to masks not working or even being harmful. As you can imagine, the anti-mask movement is not small and I found a ton of articles and videos and resources all promoting this point of view. Faced with this massive list of masks don't work resources that I was going to go through, I was honestly a little worried. I came from the perspective that masks do work and was I about to have those beliefs challenged? You may have heard of a meta-analysis. This is a mega-analysis. So after looking at all of these articles, all of these studies, all of these videos, what does the science say? And these are all, again, things sent to me from anti-masks. They're supposed to show that masks do not work. So in the end, all the things that were sent to me, what do they say? First question, do the studies show that masks work or not? And the answer is unequivocally, 100%, they all show that masks work. It's 100% true that masks are far more effective at stopping the spread of the disease as opposed to stopping getting infected. I mean, very simply, don't we tell people to cover their noses when they sneeze just outside of a pandemic? And the reason why we do that is to stop the spread to other people. So clearly a mask is also going to help that. We've never said if somebody sneezes, block your face. In terms of the studies themselves, every single valid study shows that masks have a very protective effect. Not necessarily every single study that gets conducted is the best study out there. You might think this is some kind of cop-out, but it's really not. So this is one of the studies that keeps getting referred to as proof that masks don't work. And this I do not consider a valid study. Why is this not a valid study? This study looked at 32 healthcare workers and broke them into two groups. One group had masks, the other group didn't have masks. What did they find? One person in each group got a cold. So in other words, they concluded that there was no evidence of a protective effect because you had one out of 16 in each group getting a cold. Clearly, you need a larger study. And of course, they do say this. So this is not what you consider a valid study. This is another study that gets quoted as proof that masks don't work. What happened here? They only recruited a third of the subjects that they originally wanted to recruit and canceled the study. The reason why they did so was because there was a really short and mild flu season, i.e. not enough infections, same problem as the previous study. They were going to extend the study over the next season, but then H1N1 hit and part of the governmental response was distributing surgical masks to everybody. So, of course, they decided to cancel the trial because it would be impossible to have a control group of people without masks. So this is a study that is also invalid and that is quoted by anti-maskers. This next one is another example of an invalid study. What this was, was they took four patients. Well, obviously with four patients, there's much too little of a sample size, so we can cancel it right there. But anyway, there were four people that had COVID that were coughing into a Petri dish that was placed in front of them. And they placed a mask in front of them and saw whether or not there was any COVID particles detected on the Petri dish and then took it off and did the same. On top of it being just four patients, they didn't consider their own instrument's level of detection. So what I mean is that the device that they're using to detect whether or not there's any COVID on the Petri dish cannot tell the difference between anything under 2.63 log copies per milliliter and zero, because that's just the limit of detection of the actual instrument. And here we see that there's a lot of measurements here that first of all, didn't detect anything and then detected less than 2.63. So this is completely inadmissible. The authors themselves retracted the study based on the level of detail. 
They themselves said our findings are uninterpretable. And yet this is one of the many studies that the anti-maskers keep going back to. I should also point out that these studies that I'm pointing out, these are not the exception. These studies are used over and over by multiple anti-mask sources. This next one is often given as an example of randomized control trials that don't show that masks work. The big problem with this trial is that, yes, they had a mask group and a no mask group, and they found no significant difference between the two groups. The problem is the adherence. So in the medical mask group, only 56% reported wearing their mask most of the time. In the cloth mask group, only 56% reported wearing the mask most of the time. And in the control group, 23% of the time, they were wearing a mask even though they weren't supposed to. Of those in the control, 90% of them wore medical masks or superior. So if you start comparing the cloth mask to the control arm, you got to consider the fact that only half of the cloth mask people wore cloth masks and 25% of the people in your no mask group actually wore masks and wore masks that were superior to the cloth masks. So unless you track adherence and then also look at the adherent group. So in the cloth mask group, those who wore their masks all the time compared to those in the control group, those who never wore a mask, only at that point can you actually look at the relative value of those two things. So again, this is why this study is not valid. So this one in particular was looking at the effect of hand washing and face masks to reduce influenza transmission, and this is within households in Thailand. And what they found was that there was no difference in the groups that hand washed and used face masks versus the group that did not. And they noted that in particular, there was an exact same type of study that was done in Hong Kong, and yet they did find a protective effect. So they're asking themselves, why is that the case? So they started to look at what are the difference in behavior between Thailand and Hong Kong. And one of the big things was that in Thailand, the kids who were infected with influenza were sleeping in the same room as the adults, whereas that is not common in Hong Kong. So it's kind of like a variant of the adherence thing. And that's why I consider these kinds of studies not truly valid because they're not truly comparing masks on all the time versus no masks. That's not really what we're comparing here. There's a ton of studies that are actually comparisons of the protective effects of different types of masks. So they'll look at like N95s versus surgical masks. And oftentimes there, there'll be a quote that say something like no additional protective effect was found. And anti-maskers will take that as the quote to show, hey, masks don't work. But the study was N95 versus surgical. No additional protective effect means the N95 protected just as much or just as little as the surgical mask. We identified six clinical studies. In the meta-analysis of the clinical studies, we found no significant difference. Blah, blah, blah. Associated risk, laboratory conformed, respiratory infection, influenza-like illness, or res reported workplace absenteeism. Okay, again, this sounds like it is a major victory. It shows that masks don't work. No significant difference in any of these things. So what, what did I blah, blah, blah over? No significant difference between N95 respirators and surgical masks. Okay. Again, this is a study that compares the effectiveness of N95 respirators versus surgical masks. It is not a study of N95 versus no masks. What they found was that there was no big difference between the N95s and surgical masks, that they both protected the same amount. So they're taking a lot of quotes out of context and just repurposing them. I honestly don't know whether that's malicious intent or just mistake. So aside from the studies that are invalid, there's tons of studies that are valid and all the studies that are valid show that masks work. This one here compares N95s, medical masks, and they do have a control group where there is no masks being worn. And their conclusion is the rates of all outcomes were higher in the convenience no mask group compared to the intervention arms, intervention arms being the ones wearing masks. So again, this is a study quoted by anti-maskers supposed to show the masks don't work, but that's not the conclusion they come to. I'm wondering whether the anti-maskers might be fixating on this. Rates of infection in the medical mask group were double that in the N95 group. So in other words, showing that medical masks are not as effective as N95s. Um, and they're just ignoring this other part saying that 
the no mask group has significantly higher outcomes. Anyway, again, these studies were provided to me by anti-maskers and anti-mask organizations. So that combined with the studies that actually just 100% unequivocally say that masks work. I don't really understand why you find all these links on the anti-masker sites. My feeling is that it's a combination of like not actually reading the study and then just wanting to have a bunch of stuff. So you say, hey, here are all the resources and you just have thousands of links and people are like, oh my God, this is all the science that shows the masks don't work when in fact they're not, but nobody's going to check it except for me. Ain't nobody got time for that. All of the science provided to me by anti-maskers to show that masks don't work actually show that masks work. So there's an often repeated quote that we see in all these anti-mask circles, which I think originates from this article by Dennis Rancourt. And the quote is as follows. No RCT study with verified outcome shows a benefit for healthcare workers or community members in households to wearing a mask or a respirator. There is no such study. There are no exceptions. So technically, this is true. Um, first of all, RCT means randomized control trial. The way it works is this. You take a large group of people, say 5,000 people, and you take statistical data on them based on gender, pre-existing health conditions, ethnicity, all these kinds of factors. Then you randomize the 5,000 people into two groups based on all of those factors. So in principle, you now have two groups that are equivalent. Now that the groups are randomized, you place them in two controlled groups for your trial. That means one of them is given the pill that you're studying and the other group is given a placebo. Neither the researchers nor the test subjects know which group they're in. That's blinding. So this is a randomized control trial and it's used very commonly for drug tests, for example. It's often referred to as the gold standard of testing that people use this uh, in the medical field. I'll explain by an example sent to me by Dr. Ronald Eliasoff, and he is actually a medical doctor. Let's say you want to answer the question, is penicillin effective for treating strep throat? This is an easy question to answer. You take 100 patients who have documented strep throat, half of them receive penicillin, and the other half receive a placebo. You bring the patients back in two weeks and you see how they're doing. This study has been done many times, and of course, the patients who receive penicillin fare much better. A small number of patients may experience side effects from the penicillin, but overall, the patients who receive the penicillin fare much better. The reason that this study is easy to design is that it is relatively simple to design a placebo pill that looks identical to a penicillin pill. Neither the patient nor the researchers know which patients are receiving the actual penicillin and which are receiving the placebo. So that's the blinding aspect. Determining whether face masks are effective poses a much more challenging problem. You take 100 people working in a high-risk hospital setting and have 50 of them wear face masks and the others not. It is perfectly obvious to both the researchers and the participants who is and who is not wearing a mask. Also, a number of people who agree to participate change their minds halfway through the study. Some will decide that they will wear a mask, even though they agreed to be in the placebo group, and others will do the opposite. At the end of the study, participants who wore masks may well understate their symptoms because they believe that they have been protected. For these reasons, research on face masks is inherently more difficult than research with medications, and in fact, may well prove impossible to conduct definitive, high-quality research on the effectiveness of face masks against the coronavirus. However, this should not lead us to conclude that face masks are definitive. I think he's trying to say here, conclude that face masks definitively do not work. And he goes on to say, not finding evidence that masks work is not the same as found evidence that masks don't work. And that's the whole point. In fact, there are tons of non-blinded randomized control trials that also track adherence and find a verified and significant protective effect of mask wearing. So this is in Australia. And they say no significant difference overall, significant difference between mask and control in per protocol analysis. So what does this mean? Let's take a look at the actual study. So this study compares three groups, uh, a group wearing surgical masks, a group wearing P2 masks, those are respirators, and a control group with no masks. In all cases, the sick person in the family was not wearing the mask, it's just the other people in the household. So what did they find and why does the summary say no significant difference overall? Okay, so if you look at the three different groups here, intention to treat analysis. So we find that ILI or influenza-like illness was reported in 22.3% of the surgical mask group, 15.2% in the P2 mask group, and 16% in the control group. So basically, no difference uh, between the three groups. 
definitely seems damning in terms of the effectiveness of a mask for protective protective effect. First thing I think is worth mentioning is that the study was conducted in Sydney, Australia, where mask wearing is not socially normalized. And this is going to come into play next. So why is it going to come into play? Because of adherence. So on day one of mask use, 38% of the surgical mask users and 46% of the P2 mask users stated that they were wearing the mask most or all of the time. Other participants were wearing face masks rarely or never. Adherence dropped to 31% and 25% respectively by day five of mask use. So this is not a very helpful study if you look at the results from each group without considering the impact of adherence. So if we go back to those influenza numbers, it's not that helpful considering that the amount of adherence in terms of mask wearing in the groups is so low. Thankfully, in this study, they actually tracked the adherence from each group and, and factored that into their statistical analysis. What did they found? They found that adherent use of P2 or surgical masks significantly reduces the risk for influenza-like infection if you consider adherence. So they say in their in their discussion, in the conclusion, the key findings are that less than 50% of participants were adherent with mask use, and the intention to treat analysis showed no difference between arms. However, the relative reduction in the daily risk of acquiring a respiratory infection associated with adherent mask use, P2 or surgical, was in the range of 60 to 80%. I'll also point out on the subject of adherence, they say... Although our study suggests the community use of face masks is unlikely to be an effective control policy for seasonal respiratory diseases, which is to say, in the case of regular flu, it's probably not a very good way of preventing it because people are just not going to wear masks. Adherent mask users had a significant reduction in the risk for clinical infection. So maybe in the case of non-seasonal flu, in the case of a more deadly disease where more people feel like they should wear a mask, that it actually will have a big effect. If we look at this study, they looked at 245 sick people and their 597 household contacts, which might seem like a lot, but within the three different groups that they looked at, so CRI is clinical respiratory illness, ILI is influenza-like illness, and laboratory confirmed viral respiratory infections. So in the CRI group, in the mass group, four people got sick. In the control group, six people got sick. For the ILI group, one person in the mass group got sick, three in the control group got sick. And for the laboratory confirmed, one person in each group got sick. So with regular run-of-the-mill flu, 245 participants is not enough for your study. So of course, this makes it even more difficult to do a study in the case of a highly deadly disease. If you thought you might be able to get a couple of candidates for your no mass group, you're going to have an even harder time getting a statistically significant number of participants. So. The conclusion then should not be that there's no study with verified out outcome that shows a benefit. It's that if you're running a study on something that has a beneficial effect and you do not consider one adherence, that is to say, those that are in the mask group actually wear their masks and those that are in the no mask group don't start wearing masks. If you're relying on self-reported symptoms and your study is not blinded, well, you're going to see a lot of bias there. Those that are in the mass group might underreport their symptoms thinking that they were protected, and those that were in the no mass group might overreport their symptoms for the same reason. If you don't have a large enough sample size or you don't have a very virulent disease, such as a very mild flu season. And number four, you don't control behavior within the groups to ensure adherence. So what this means, for example, is that even though you're in the mass group and you're wearing your mask all the time, if you sleep and you eat with someone infected, and those are times when you can't wear a mask, well, very clearly, that's when the infection is going to happen. So if you're testing something that has a protective effect, such as masks, but you do not consider all of these things, well, sure enough, you're going to find either no protective effect or a non-statistically significant one. The takeaway is if you don't consider these four things, you will not see a benefit in anything beneficial that you study. So the reality is it's not possible to design a blinded randomized control trial for mask protectiveness in the case of a highly infectious, highly deadly disease. That's why you get all these kinds of like infographics from the anti-maskers saying that there's no RCT showing that masks work. It's because it's not actually possible to do one. Uh, furthermore, aside from the blending issue, it's a double-edged sword. 
you can't create a mask study with a deadly, super infectious disease because nobody will want to be in the control group not wearing masks. You can't make a mask study with a not deadly disease or a not very infectious disease because the people who are supposed to wear masks are not going to adhere. They're not going to wear their mask all the time. They're like, what's the big deal? It's not that deadly. So what that means is that in order to look at the effectiveness of masks, you're going to have to look at adherence, i.e. who actually wore the mask or who in the control group did not wear the mask. You're going to have to look at very large sample sizes. Like I said, if you're not dealing with your deadly disease in order to have your control group that doesn't wear masks, well, you're going to have low adherence, that's for sure. So you're going to need a lot more people in order to track a statistically significant result. Of course, that there is no mask protectiveness test that can ever be blinded. There is no way of creating a placebo that is ethical. You cannot have a group of guys wearing masks and then a group of guys wearing like fake masks that don't work. That would be highly unethical. But you know what? The more I think about it, there actually is a way to create a randomized control trial, um, although not a blinded one, but a true randomized control trial with a highly infectious deadly disease. So what you need is a large pool of people that would be interacting with sick individuals who are wearing masks, so healthcare workers, something like that. Uh, that should be easy enough. But you need a control group of people who are anti-maskers and who will still work with all these highly infectious disease people and not wear a mask. So if we have a control group with healthcare workers that are anti-maskers, not wearing masks, and a mask group of healthcare workers that wear masks, we should actually be able to devise a study that will give us some reasonable results. So anti-maskers, please step forward and let's test your beliefs. <laughs> we will literally put a nail in the coffin on the mask debate. <laughs> Another argument that's often used to show that masks cannot possibly work uses the micron sizes of the coronavirus particle compared to the pore size of a mask. So, of course, a mask is not completely solid. There are tiny holes in here. Coronavirus particle is 0.1 microns, but the N95 mask varies between 2.5 microns and 10 microns in size. So clearly, if you have holes of that size, the coronavirus particle will be able to pass through. Therefore, masks can't possibly work. First of all, in terms of studies, there's lots of studies where they fire particles at the masks and they see the relative effectiveness. So this is a study looking at different masks and how they perform in terms of reducing particulate matter exposure in terms of reducing particles getting through. So here's some of the results. What we're looking at here is the filtration efficiency. So higher is better and different types of masks. So the N95s are here and these different bars are the different particle sizes from smaller to larger. So you can see N95s do quite well and cloth mask one does quite well as well. Surgical mask does okay. Cloth mask two and three are less good. So really, again, what this shows is that there's not a lot of standardization in cloth masks, but some cloth masks can do very well in terms of protective effect. Um, here, this baseline, this is an N95 mask. So it's got almost 0% penetration of particles. These here are various types of cloth masks. So obviously, they're much less effective at blocking particles. What I always find funny about this particular study is that it turns out there is a scarf from Walmart that is super effective at blocking particles. Anyway, Despite the overwhelming evidence that the masks do work, I haven't responded directly to the particle size versus pore size argument. Um, and it does seem counterintuitive to think that masks should work at all or should work as well as they do, given this fact. So there's a number of great videos and resources that cover this in detail, but I'll give kind of the Coles note version here. So first of all, yes, the COVID particles are 0.1 microns or 100 nanometers in diameter, but they travel in aerosols and droplets. So how big are those? So there's a lot of debate as to where you make the cutoff between an aerosol and a droplet. But if we look over here, I would say that like the bulk of the particles are between two and let's say 16 or 24 micrometers. So we're talking about 2000 to 16,000 nanometers, except for the 16,000, the 2000 to say 10 is still within the range of the size of the pores on the mask. So it still would seem that those aerosols and droplets should be able to pass through quite easily. But it definitely at that point, it starts to feel more intuitively obvious that particles of that size could still be blocked, even though the holes are rather large. So even though we think of a mask as being very thin, of course, when we talk about particles that are 2000 nanometers to 16,000 nanometers, this is definitely thicker than 2000 or 16,000 nanometers. So if we look at this study over here, they give thickness of different types of mask. And we can say that they vary from 0.2 to 0.6. That's in millimeters. So that translates 
to 200,000 to 600,000 nanometers. So now think of it this way. If you have particles, 2,000 to 16,000 nanometers that have to travel through a maze of meshes that have holes in them that are 2,500 to 10,000 nanometers big for a total distance of 200,000 to 600,000 nanometers, how many do you think we'll be able to pass through? That's a distance of at least 10 times and at most 300 times their diameter that they would have to travel through. Furthermore, when we're dealing with particles of this size, we're not talking about throwing a baseball. They don't travel in straight lines. The air currents push these aerosols and droplets in all kinds of directions, not to mention they're so small that they actually collide with air molecules. This is referred to as Brownian motion if you want to Google this. So these things are getting bounced in all directions, increasing the chance that they hit the mesh. Lastly, in the case of N95 respirators, they contain a layer of permanently electrostatically charged fibers. And the attractive force of these electrostatic fibers captures the small particles and attracts them to the fibers. That's part of the reason why N95s are even more protective than other types of masks. So yes, although it may be true that the micron sizes of the coronavirus particle itself is smaller than the pore size of the mask, that's not how masks work and that's not how coronavirus particles travel in the air. On both a theoretical level and in laboratory tested conditions and in observational studies of the real world, the masks work and N95s in particular provide a very strong protective effect. Lastly, since we're on the topic of particle sizes, oxygen is 346 picometers in diameter. Carbon dioxide is 330 picometers in diameter. Translated into microns, that would be 0.000346 for oxygen and 0.00330 for carbon dioxide. Clearly, an N95 mask will not cause any significant change in your ability to breathe oxygen or CO2 because those things are so tiny compared to the pore sizes. Furthermore, if you believe that masks can't block coronavirus because the coronavirus particles should fit through the holes, which they don't, then you can't simultaneously believe that they will stop you from breathing in O2 or stop you from getting the CO2 outside of your mask because those are even smaller. And this leads us to next question. Are masks bad for your health? There's many different arguments that are used here from masks lowering your O2 intake and increasing the amount of CO2 to masks being made out of toxic materials. The short answer is that none of that is true. So the first question, do masks reduce your oxygen levels? Well, okay, here's the studies that again, anti-maskers themselves sent to me that is supposed to show that masks reduce your O2 level. This was a study where they tested surgeons' oxygen levels before and after surgeries of different lengths. Here you find the duration of the surgery. And this here is the oxygen level before the surgery. And this here is the oxygen level after the surgery. So on the surface, it looks like, yes, there's a drop. First of all, the saturation level is 99% here to 95. This is not zero. So the change in saturation level is going from 1% to at most 2% after a four hour operation. Is this drop in oxygen due to wearing a mask or is it just due to the stress from doing an operation? Well, it turns out they actually had a group of surgeons that were able to do short operations without wearing a mask. And in those cases, their pre-operational saturation values were 97.6% and post-operation was 96.3%. So they had a similar one and a half percent drop in O2 level, despite not wearing a mask. It should also be pointed out that the study itself mentions that normal blood O2 saturation level is defined as somewhere between 90 and 97.5 percent. Unquestionably, their saturation levels stayed within this normal amount. Still, undoubtedly, there is a drop recorded, but it seems more likely that this is due to the stress of surgery than necessarily the mask. This study is a more valuable one in terms of drop in O2 levels. So what this finds is that after four hours of wearing a mask, these patients in fact had a 10% drop in oxygen level. Now, why is this different than the surgeons? The reason why this is different is that we're dealing with patients in end stage renal disease who are undergoing four hours of dialysis. I should also point out that this study does not have a control group, so they didn't have a group of people in end-stage renal disease doing dialysis without wearing a mask. We don't know if under normal dialysis, their oxygen level would drop by 5%, and then with the mask, they drop by 10. We really don't know. So I did just a little bit of Googling, and I found this. 
Dialysis causes lowered blood oxygen levels. It is known that oxygen levels in the arterial blood can drop 5 to 23% during dialysis. Furthermore, fatigue is a big issue during dialysis. Many end-stage renal disease patients have sleep disorders. And so, during dialysis, they even suggest that you can watch TV or a movie, read, nap. Of course, if you're asleep, your oxygen levels drop even further. For normal, healthy people, if your waking oxygen saturation is greater than about 94% on room air, it is unlikely that your saturation during sleep will fall below 88%. So that's a 6% drop for a normal healthy person between being awake and being asleep. So a measured 10% drop in these hemodialysis patients with end-stage renal disease that were wearing masks after four hours of dialysis is completely meaningless without a control group. I say meaningless only in the context of the mask possibly causing the drop in oxygen level. I think it's fair to say that if you have health problems, serious health problems like end-stage renal disease, you should definitely be consulting your doctor before wearing a mask for extended periods of time. Lastly, we look at this study which put healthcare workers on treadmills and some of them had masks, some of them didn't have masks. They tracked various physiological markers and here's what they found. If you look at the O2 levels, there is no change at all except for a very small increase in CO2 levels. So we're seeing here from the control group, 40.7 in CO2 up to 41 or actually a drop in this case from 40 in the control group to 42, those with the masks. And then here we had 40 going up to 41 or again, a drop to 39 and then here 40 to 42. So a very small increase in CO2, if at all, and it's smaller than the error inherent to the test. There's also many non-oxygen related reasons why some people might not wear a mask that should be considered. Of course, you may have experienced discomfort or headaches from wearing masks. I've definitely gotten a couple after wearing a mask for a very long period of time, um, but the discomfort level is pretty mild, at least for me anyway. The research right now seems to point at the likelihood that the straps are the cause for uh, discomfort and headaches, which is also in line with my personal experience. There's many ways of mitigating this. For example, instead of hoops around the ears, using hoops around the top and the bottom of the head. You can also buy or make a little plastic barrette that you would put on the back of the head and attach the straps around. And this actually is one that my wife made out of a plastic bottle. Just cut it with scissors. Very simple. There's also plenty of great designs and ideas here in the description below. You can find all these links. That said, I think it's pretty inevitable that there's going to be pressure at some contact point with your face and that's going to possibly cause a headache. Okay, next one, we got a little infographic meme. Did you know bacterial pneumonia was the number one cause of death during the Spanish flu? It was caused by masks and Dr. Fauci wrote a paper about it and they have a link to the paper. So let's take a look at that one. If you look through this paper and look for masks, you will find absolutely nothing. Uh, Fauci is quoted in here and he says that Viral damage followed by bacterial pneumonia led to the vast majority of deaths. Doesn't say anything about masks. Let's look at Fauci's study where this is quoted from. Again, th there is literally nothing in this study referring to masks. It's a study that finds that bacterial pneumonia may have been a leading cause of death in the 1918-1919 Spanish flu. So yeah, this is definitely one of the most made up memes infographics I've ever seen. Okay, let's move on. Saw this meme that pointed out that Teflon is used in some surgical masks and uh, Teflon is toxic. I mean, yes, that's true. Teflon is toxic, but uh, Teflon is also added to a lot of clothing for spill resistance. It's used in nonstick pans. So really, it's only dangerous if you heat it to extremely high temperatures and begins to melt. That's why nonstick pans that we put food in are not considered dangerous on low heat. So no, the Teflon in masks is not dangerous. The only case that I think that you should be concerned if you're perfectly healthy, but you want to wear a mask is intense exercise. Again, there's no study that shows that there's any danger, but I can definitely see just like in a really intense situation, you have it like, I wouldn't wear a scarf if I was going into intense exercise. I feel like that might increase the chance that I'll pass out. So just be careful if you got to exercise and for some reason you have to do it in a public setting where you're wearing a mask. Otherwise, just exercise at home for now. Uh, not to mention all the sweat and the, just the heat coming off of your pores is going to cause your mask to get moist and no longer be effective. So... I don't think it really makes sense to exercise in public right now. But anyway, if you're in average health, wearing a mask could pose absolutely no negative effect. Lastly, if masks did cause a negative effect, well, surgeons would have all kinds of crazy health problems and dentists would have all kinds of crazy health problems, but they don't. So there's more evidence. Mask education is very important. 
Improper mask use can definitely be dangerous. A mask campaign on how to wear, adjust, handle, when to dispose of a mask, I think that would be a great educational campaign. I want to make a distinction here. Telling people you must wear a mask, that is not education. That's just telling people what you want them to do. I think we've all seen like police vans with recorded messages saying you've got to socially distance and wear a mask and blah, blah, blah. That is not education. I don't know who the heck okayed that. That's some like science fiction police state stuff. <laughs> Put down your weapon. You have 20 seconds to comply. Your attention, please. <sighs> Under the Public Health Act, you are ordered to maintain a minimum distance of two meters between each of you. <sighs> you now have 15 seconds to comply. So education is not telling people what you want them to do. Education is telling people why certain behaviors will lead to a positive outcome for themselves and for others. Instead of a police van blaring out, do this, do this, do this, have the police walk around wearing a mask, showing how to wear a mask correctly, going and engaging with people, maybe telling people who don't wear the mask correctly how to wear it correctly, talk to people, ask them how they feel about it engage, educate. It's really perceived as you got to do this or you're going to get in trouble as opposed to if we do this, we can get out of this mess. Next point, masking the healthy doesn't make sense. It's true, except we know that people who do not show any symptoms might be infectious and might be able to transmit the disease. So you cannot quarantine or mask only the people who are sick because we don't know who's sick. The whole logic about universal masking is because we don't know who's sick, so we put a mask on everyone, and that way an unknowingly sick person is less likely to transmit the disease to healthy people. But health official XYZ said not to wear a mask. Right now in the United States, people should not be walking around with masks. So the confusion here is disrecommending a mask at the early stage of the pandemic and the reasons why. In fact, every health official or doctor that disrecommended wearing a mask did so for the same two reasons. One was trying to preserve masks for healthcare workers. When you think masks, you should think of healthcare providers needing them and people who are ill. Two was the fear that if you wore a mask, you would have a false sense of security and not take the other health precautions. There are unintended consequences. People keep fiddling with the mask and they keep touching their face. But here's the most important thing. Now, even if you do wear a mask, it can't be at the expense of social distancing. We don't want people to think, hey, I'm going to wear a face covering so it's appropriate for me to go out around other people. That said, many anti-maskers are also anti-social distancing, anti-lockdown, all these kinds of things. So you kind of can't be all of these and also trying to control the spread of the virus. It should be noted that every health official and every doctor that put out a message like this early on in the pandemic had to put out a correction later on. That said, I've yet to hear any of these people actually say, I was wrong, I made a mistake, and I think this is a big problem with the communication. Politicians especially never want to admit when they're wrong because they think they'll be out of a job. Tell you what, if a politician routinely said, I was wrong and I learned from my mistakes, here's the updated way we should approach this, man, there's somebody that I would actually have respect for. And that particular photo... I did make a mistake. I should have stepped further forward. I should have asked them to step apart from each other. And I acknowledge that. As opposed to politicians who say there's no systemic racism in Quebec, and then they get repeatedly faced with examples of systemic racism. They're like, uh, no, that's a, that's just a, that's an isolated, that's racism. Well, that's also, that's just a one time. That's a, oh, and that's also. For me, when we talk uh, about systemic racism, for me, I don't see that in Quebec. Experts that are not. Dell Bigtree, Ben Swan, whoever runs nomask.info, Global Research and John C.A. Manley, Much Ado About Corona.ca, and John C.A. Manley again, Bright Light News, Fearless Canada, Technocracy.news, Sot.net, and Dr. Margareta Grisperson, Russell Blaylock, Tammy Clark and Kirsten Megan, Dr. Dennis Rancourt, Dr. Garrett Soldano, Dr. Michael Gaeta, Robert Zimmerman, The Doctors Wolfson, Dr. Eric Napudi, Josh Trent of Wellness Force, Zach Bush, the list goes on, Del Bigtree, He's an anti-vaxxer. He produced a film based on Andrew Wakefield's discredited uh, study. I would put this guy in the same category as Alex Jones. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! 
Ben Swan is an anti-vaxxer. He is a conspiracy theorist big time, including claiming that certain school shootings were not committed by the people that were found to have committed them. Another wannabe, Alex Jones. What is my problem? When someone introduces themselves as a doctor in order to validate their opinions, you should really be checking into that. A lot of these people are not like medical doctor doctors. So for example, Dennis Brancourt, PhD, it's a PhD not in medicine. He's a PhD in physics. And he was fired from the University of Ottawa and banned from the campus in 2008. So out of a job for the last 12 years. If you're a fan of Dennis Rancourt, you should also know that he is a climate change denier. Garrett Soldano and Eric Naputi have Doctor of Chiropractic degrees, which is not the same as a medical doctor. Furthermore, Dr. Eric Naputi received a letter from the FTC telling him to stop saying that the vitamin D supplements that he's selling are the cure to coronavirus, essentially. Dr. Michael Gaeta is a doctor of acupuncture in Rhode Island. And the list goes on. I should say for these guys, I don't doubt their ability as health professionals in a general sense, but it's a bit disingenuous to be giving out advice regarding a highly infectious, highly deadly disease and referring to yourself as a doctor in this context. And especially then saying, oh, and just buy my vitamin supplements, they'll, they'll fix you up. Doctors like me. Why are you always lying? I don't even understand what we're even freaking talking about. And then, of course, there are totally legit doctors who have seemingly gone off the deep end on this stuff. I kind of wonder in a lot of these cases if it's like an attention thing. They, they said a few controversial things. They got a lot of media interest and then they just doubled down on those beliefs. But anyway, as the old joke goes, what do you call a medical student that finished last in their class? Hi, everybody. But doctors are people, too, and they may have preconceived beliefs and that preconceived beliefs will skew their perspective on anything that they're looking at. So when looking at any meta study or commentary, or opinion piece, you got to look back at the studies that they're actually quoting and seeing what those studies actually said. If you're writing this article and you have a pre-held belief, you're simply going to keep writing with that pre-held belief in mind and pushing that perspective all the way through. So the point is not that these guys are nuts, although possibly a few of them are nuts, but you should really be looking at what they have to say with an extreme grain of salt. I think most are not nuts. I think most are opportunists. They all have ulterior motives and or other agendas that they're pushing, digging deeper and deeper and deeper into the lie that they've created for themselves. That said, it would be a fallacy to conclude that anything coming out of these people is wrong. And that's really the frustrating thing. Even though they say a bunch of stuff that's wrong, there might be a few nuggets of truth and very valuable truth in what they're saying. So don't condemn everything they say. Just triple check when they say something that resonates with you and see whether you're going with it because it resonates purely or because it's actually true. I believe that people are capable of change, especially in the face of overwhelming contradictory evidence. So hopefully some of them will see this. They'll update their beliefs when they see that it's not based on sound evidence. Hopefully. A part of this whole discussion on anti-maskers and conspiracy theories has to be censorship and the role of websites and social media platforms in distributing information. The core question is, should platforms like Facebook and YouTube be considered merely tools or should they be considered publishers and be responsible for their content? I think the answer is somewhere in between and everyone's going to draw that line differently. I personally don't believe in censorship. If somebody says something really hateful, I think it should stay out there and other people should see that this person said this thing. I believe in investigating those claims, reaching out and communicating and educating. As a concrete example of this, back in 2001, when the 9-11 attack happened, there was a widely circulated conspiracy video called Loose Change. I watched it like many others, and I was totally convinced. I was like, oh my God, this is an inside job, and this it must have been a missile and not a plane. I believed every aspect of the damn thing. Thankfully, the video was not taken down immediately, and I got to re-watch it, and then started to look at some of the claims made and started to realize that, oh, this is falling apart, this doesn't make sense, this is false, this is false. This is false. The final nail in the coffin for me was when Popular Mechanics invited them onto their show to discuss. Popular Mechanics challenged the makers of the film on every single statement they made, and it was very obvious that those guys were just a bunch of jokers. Anyway, the point is, don't take the videos down. Leave them up so that the next time those guys make something, people know, oh, wait, those are the guys that made loose change. I don't believe those guys. Those guys are not cases. The problem with removing that kind of content is many fold. Number one, it makes it really difficult to look back and debunk any claims. If my buddy says, hey, I saw this video and it said this thing, I can't find it and look into it myself. I'm trusting my friend who said this. I'm like, oh, well, I trust my friend. So therefore it must be true. But if the video is still up there, I can go, I can take a look at it and be like, hey, actually it's full of crap. And this is why. And then maybe I can help my friend. If we don't take down their content, the next time they put up new content, we can look at the history of stuff that they've done. And we can say like, oh yeah, that's the guy that did this. That's the guy that did this. That's the guy that did this. So I don't trust their new thing. Instead of just putting a gag order on everything, leave the content up, but put a massive warning label. This is like video game ratings where they say this contains violence, this contains whatever. 
do that with these videos and articles and let other people just see how ridiculous they are. If you just censor and deplatform all these people, they're going to move off of those platforms and create their own platforms where there is no oversight. So keep them on YouTube, keep them on Facebook, but put a massive warning label on them. Killing people's accounts and removing their content just emboldens them ever further. It creates martyrs. And that just makes people think that, yes, we're fighting the good fight. See, they took my stuff down, but it was real. Bad idea. So to my friends who are anti-maskers, you are being manipulated. Who are you being manipulated by? Well, surely the number of attention whores and vitamin supplement sellers can't be that great, can it? Well, first of all, never underestimate the number of attention whores and vitamin supplement sellers there are. Secondly, let's look at these two for a second. So these both are these kind of like image macro meme type things, and they both start with, did you know? In both cases, they're completely, completely false. So the last time we saw memes and social media being used like this to get out a, a disruptive message, destabilizing the left and right, and so greater division in the USA, it was theorized to be due to Russian hackers. And all of these memes that I've seen, at least, are in favor of masks not working, Corona being a hoax, etc. All of this would be in favor of big Trump win. So I'm not saying this is all from the Russian hackers, but... So anyway, like I said, everything that I've looked at here has been resources sent to me by anti-maskers. But I did a little bit of quick Googling and I found a bunch of studies very easily that show unequivocally that masks work. This one shows a drop in masked healthcare worker infections during COVID. This one shows the efficacy of many, many different types of masks, including cloth masks. This one shows the filtration efficiency of many different types of masks, including cloth masks and even a freaking coffee filter. This one is a countrywide study of different strategies effects showing that mask mandates work. Uh, this report was published in June using data from May. So anyone who had a mask mandate at that point enacted a mask mandate relatively early in the pandemic. By comparison in Quebec, it wasn't until July 28th that a mask mandate came in, which of course is way too little, way too late. So in conclusion, masks work. Masks are not dangerous unless you have some serious pre-existing health conditions. Consult your doctor if you do. And every single study that has a sufficiently large sample size considers adherence, i.e. the people in the mask group actually wear their masks and the people in the no mask don't wear masks. And three, have sufficient controls within their group so that, for example, even though you're in the mask group doesn't mean you can sleep in the same room with somebody who's infected while not wearing a mask. So if the study considers those three things, then they unequivocally show that masks work. Despite the fact that the coronavirus particle and aerosols and droplets are technically smaller than the pore sizes in N95 and surgical masks, they still work because of the way that tiny particles move. They don't move in straight lines, they move around. They get caught inside what is actually a very thick mask when we're talking about microscopic sizes. And on top of it, this is not just supported by the theoretical basis, but it's also supported by multiple lab tests where they will fire particles of various sizes at different kinds of materials and see that they don't make it through. N95 masks respirators are the most effective and definitely should be saved for healthcare workers. Surgical masks, for the most part, seem to be less effective, but some studies show that they're about the same level of effectiveness as an N95. And cloth masks are by far the least effective, but they're still effective. Wearing, handling, and cleaning a mask properly are very important. And if you don't do that, you can completely negate the protective effect of the mask. Of course, mask wearing alone is not some kind of magical solution that will completely stop the spread of infection. But that combined with social distancing, avoiding touching your face and hand washing, avoiding indoor situations or heavily ventilating the indoor situations, and avoiding large groups of people. Masks alone have some protective effect, but when combined with all of those things, the protective effect is considerably higher. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So what topic do you want me to get into next? Please put that down in the comments below. I can get into the Great Barrington Declaration. I can get into COVID versus flu numbers. I can maybe answer the question, is COVID dangerous? But that's a massive topic. I could ask the question of whether hydroxychloroquine works. Let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to get into next. Like I said, the studies I researched in order to make this video came directly from anti-maskers. And there was more than a hundred of them I went through. So for the next little while, I'll be releasing more detailed breakdowns of each one of those studies. I'd like to take a moment to thank Dr. Ronald Lyasoff, who helped me out with some of the more technical language. He actually is a medical doctor, but he did not approve any of the content in this video. So any errors or whatever are my own. So on the subject of errors, I'm very curious what you think of my breakdown and whether my breakdown is accurate or not, whether I made some big logical errors in anything. Please put them down in the comments below. I'm very interested in engaging with people and learning more. That's the way that we get better. So if you made it this far and you're still enjoying this, once again, I'll say don't like and subscribe. Just 
wash your hands and wear a mask. Let's get our numbers to zero. I'm Vincent Stephen Ong. I am not a doctor and we'll see you next time. Wow. You stayed for the bonus content. Okay. First of all, let me ask you two favors. Share this with your anti-mask friends. Engage with them. It isn't too late to appeal to reason. Everyone can be wrong. All that matters is how we learn from it. In the description or in the comments below, there should be a table of contents with time codes towards every single item in this video. If a friend of yours is sharing one of these specific studies, you can link directly to the time code so that they know what to check out. Please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. I need 100 subscribers in order to get a vanity URL, so let's do it. This video is really about mask effectiveness. It should not be taken as a takedown of the anti-mask movement. Despite the fact that their stance is not based on scientific data, there's still a lot of things they say that I can agree with, and I think some of our motivations are the same. First of all, I'm not even sure anti-mask is the right name for these groups. There seems to be a lot of different beliefs in there. What I do know is that a lot of these groups have a problem with the government handling, they have a sense of being lied to, and they don't think that lockdowns work. I can relate to a lot of that. Like I said in my last video, Taiwan never had a lockdown, but they got their numbers to zero. That said, what worked in the early days is not necessarily what will work now, and countries that are still dealing with it now are dealing with far greater community transmission than Taiwan ever had. At this point, for most of these countries, lockdown might be one of the only viable strategies left. What I think is idiotic is this kind of like semi-lockdown that a lot of countries are stuck in. Here in Quebec, over the summer, when our cases were at a low of around 100 a day, we loosened and loosened and loosened instead of trying to get those numbers to zero. If we had gotten those numbers to zero, we would have had no second wave at all. By comparison, Taiwan had 605 cases in total. We're not talking about 605 per day, in total. Anyway, we didn't get our cases down to zero. Now we seem to be in the middle of this intractable second wave. So we know that masks work, but do government enforced mask mandates work? I think the key here really is consistency. If on the one hand, you're going to require people to wear masks indoors when they go shopping and so on, why is it you reopen schools, which are indoors, and not require kids to wear masks? Why is it then that you're surprised when there's an outbreak in the schools? Why were portable ventilation systems and filtration systems not purchased for schools knowing that they would reopen and have this problem? Here in Quebec, prior to the pandemic, mask use was not a normalized behavior and it still isn't. So if you want mask wearing to become normalized, you have to make a radical shift. You have to also lead by example. It took six months into the pandemic before I started seeing police officers wearing masks. What about government workers in general, bus drivers, STM workers, people working in parks, etc.? You got to lead by example. And in terms of mask mandates, I think that Dutch study is a very good example. What this was is a study in Denmark. They looked at 3,000 people wearing masks when outside the home and had a control group of 3,000 people instructed not to wear masks. Um, what they found was that 1.8% of the mask group developed COVID and 2.1% of the control group who were not wearing masks developed COVID. Uh, on the surface, this seems like a really good test, you know, randomized control trial, really good test of whether masks work or not. And it seems like the masks have almost no effect. I mean, there was an effect, but very very small. That said, if we look a little deeper, so during the study period, so April to June, Danish authorities did not recommend use of masks in the community and mask use was uncommon, less than 5% outside of hospitals. So really what we're talking about is a very tiny group of 3000 people within a giant group of the entire city not wearing masks. So obviously this tiny group, even though they're wearing masks, they're going to find almost no protective effect of wearing the masks within the context of the massive group of thousands and thousands or probably millions of people wearing not wearing masks. So my takeaway from this is that when the next pandemic hits, it's really not worth wearing a mask unless there's a universal mask mandate. If you're just one of a small group wearing a mask, well, there's going to be very little protective effect in your group. In other words, if 1% of the population wears a mask, they will not be significantly protected from the 99% who are not wearing masks. And that's not a surprising result to me. A more interesting result would be, did the members of the mask group who got COVID transmit it to less people? Of course, that's way beyond the scope of this study, but that would be interesting data to see. When they look at their own study, they do mention that the results are inconclusive, missing data, variable adherence, there was self-reported findings, there was no blinding, no assessment of whether masks could decrease increased disease transmission from mask wearers to others, which is exactly what I just said. We saw very little difference between the mask group and the no mask group. That kind of shows to me that if you want to mandate masks, you have to do it fully, just like you cannot do it everywhere, but not in schools and not in here, not in here, you're going to start having infections in those areas.
So anyway, I've done my best to exhaust every single possible avenue in terms of the whole mask discussion and whether they work or not. The next video will not be as long as this one, that is for sure. Anyway, that's it. Once again, I'm not a doctor. Have a good one. Stay safe, everybody.